Premiums are going up. Insurance companies are bouncing policyholders. And the Obamacare website is still not working. Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey is here to give us his take. Then the frights just keep coming. 40 years ago, a film set right here in Washington scared the world. William Blatty and William Friedkin, the screenwriter and director of The Exorcist, are here in an exclusive interview to tell us about the making of the movie and what it's really about. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We're delighted you decided to drop in. An All Hallows' Eve special for you. Bill Blatty and William Friedkin and Congressman Chris Smith are straight ahead. As always, if you have a question or a comment about tonight's show, you can tweet them to Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN. Dot com. Lots to cover, but first, here's the brief news from the world over this week. The rough rollout of President Obama's Affordable Care Act continues. Website problems, reports of jumps in monthly premiums, and now the law has caused hundreds of thousands to lose their individual health plans. Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius appeared before the House Energy and Commerce Committee on Wednesday. She took personal responsibility for the Obamacare website debacle, as she called it. The website is still not fully functional, and most potential enrollees are not able to sign up or even navigate through the healthcare.gov site. Sibelius, however, denied that President Obama's broken any promise when he had repeatedly stated that those who wish to keep their current health care coverage could keep it. NBC News reports that sources involved in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act say that anywhere from 40 to 80 percent of the 14 million Americans on individual plans will lose their current health care coverage. This is a fact that apparently the administration knew for at least three years. More on this later in the show. Meanwhile, on the HHS contraception mandate front, Michigan-based Eden Foods lost its appeal that it should be exempt from being forced to offer contraception, sterilization, and abortifacient coverage to its employees under their health care plans. This past week, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Eden and its president, Michael Potter, were not protected under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act since a for-profit corporation cannot exercise religion. Potter said in his complaint that his deeply held religious beliefs prevent him from supporting contraception and abortion. Now EWTN has joined, or been joined rather, by the state of Alabama in a new lawsuit against the contraception mandate. A suit filed last February by the network was dismissed by a federal judge. She ruled that the matter should be deferred until the mandate's new regulations were finalized. The case is among the more than 70 lawsuits challenging the contraception mandate. And a federal judge on Monday struck down portions of Texas's recently passed abortion industry regulations. U.S. District Judge Lee Yackel ruled that requiring abortion doctors to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital created a substantial obstacle and an undue burden for a woman seeking an abortion. A limited injunction was issued on the requirement that all abortions take place in surgical centers. That provision would have ended the distribution of abortion drugs that could be taken at home. The ruling came one day before the provisions were to go into effect. The judge let stand the state ban on abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Texas is now among 10 states that prohibit late-term abortions on the basis of fetal pain. And violence continued across Syria this week with videos showing air attacks in the provinces of Hama and Homs. Meanwhile, the remaining 2,000 residents of a war-ravaged Damascus neighborhood evacuated their homes on Tuesday. 
aid organizations had negotiated a rare temporary ceasefire between government forces and rebels in order to end a growing humanitarian crisis. Starvation and disease began to take hold in the western suburb, triggering an international outcry. Syrian troops had blockaded the rebel-held area, keeping food and supplies from entering. Mother Agnes Mariam, who runs a Christian aid group and negotiated the ceasefire, explained the desperation. We received uh, calls from inside uh, Mohaddamiya and uh, from the people that, uh, from inhabitants that were outside, displaced outside Mohaddamiya, that they would prefer to go out because uh, it's not only a matter of uh, eating, uh, but also it's a matter, you know, of security. The evacuees were taken to temporary shelters. Meanwhile, the Grand Mufti of Syria says that two Orthodox bishops who were kidnapped in Syria in April are alive and are now being held in Turkey. The Grand Mufti claims the two prelates from Aleppo, Syriac Orthodox Archbishop Johanna Ibrahim and Greek Orthodox Archbishop Paul Yazigi, were abducted by Chechen militants and their Turkish confederates. The Grand Mufti's account could not be independently confirmed, and it differs with prevailing reports that the bishops were kidnapped by Syrian rebels. We'll keep you posted. Back here on Capitol Hill, weeks after announcing military aid to Egypt would be pared back, the Obama administration is now asking Congress to remove any potential aid restrictions to the current Cairo regime. During a House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing on Tuesday, administration officials asked Congress to provide a workaround to current law which prohibits U.S. aid to governments that come to power by force. The administration has avoided labeling July's military-led ouster of Mohamed Morsi as a coup. That designation would bar any further aid there. Members of the committee expressed concern that the decades-long strategic relationship between the nations and Washington's influence with Egypt have eroded. The U.S. provides more than a billion dollars in military aid to Egypt annually. Meanwhile, the United Arab Emirates announced earlier in the week it has boosted its aid package to Egypt to $4.9 billion. And there are few new bishop appointments of note on this side of the Atlantic. In Canada, Bishop Richard Gagnon of Victoria was appointed Archbishop of Winnipeg. And in the U.S., Toledo, Ohio, Bishop Leonard Blair is the new shepherd of the Archdiocese of Hartford. And Father Kurt Burnett was appointed Bishop of the Eparchal See of Passaic in New Jersey. It's one of the four eparchies of the Ruthenian Catholic Church of the Byzantine tradition in the United States. And finally, what would a celebration of the family be without an unpredictable child? During the church's celebration of the family in Rome on Saturday, a young boy unexpectedly joined Pope Francis on stage to the apparent delight of the Holy Father. The boy was part of a group of children sitting around the edge of the stage during a St. Peter's Square gathering of 150,000. Pope Francis gave the boy free reign during the program, and the little guy seemed right at home. The two chatted a bit. The boy sat in the Pope's chair for as long as you would expect a boy to sit. He wandered about as Pope Francis delivered his speech and moved in for an occasional hug and a pat on the head. At one point, an aide attempted to entice the boy off stage with some candy. He wasn't having it. The boy took the candy, but when he realized he was being snookered, he ran for the Pope and clung to his leg. The boy also played papal secretary, introducing a young lady to the Pope, and later became a mini Swiss guard, preventing this stranger from getting too close. What's that old theatrical adage, never work with children and dogs? They always upstage you. When we return, there were several hearings this week about the Affordable Care Act on Capitol Hill, and the public is experiencing real difficulties. We'll examine it all with Congressman Chris Smith, when the world of our lives continues and our Halloween special straight ahead. Don't go anywhere.
once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius faced congressional scrutiny this week over the wobbly rollout of the Affordable Care Act. Millions in the U.S. have been notified that they're losing their health coverage this week with no way to sign on to new plans due to the government website breakdowns. To discuss all of it is Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. He's the co-chair of the Pro-Life Caucus and senior member of the House Foreign Relations Committee. Thank Congressman you, thank Smith, you. thanks for being here. Thanks now, you. let's start with what's happening all over the country. Kathleen Sebelius was grilled today. Two million people bounced off of their health care plans. 800,000 in your state of New Jersey notified that they no longer have health insurance plans. 279,000 in California, 140,000 in Michigan, 300,000 in Florida. What is happening? And is there any legislative redress for this? Well, and that's only the tip of the iceberg, Raymond. Uh, more will be getting those notices. The numbers will go up. People will be thrown off their current health care policy, even though President Obama looked in the camera hundreds of times and said, if you like your health care plan the way it is, you can keep it. Uh, that was an unmitigated lie. And we got to call it the way it is because they knew it's came out. It's come out this week that there was already an, an analysis done approximately three years ago by the administration that showed clearly and without any ambiguity that large numbers of people would be thrown off. And despite that information, he kept saying, in that camera lens, if you like your health care the way it is, mm. the insurance plan, you can keep it. It's not true. Congresswoman Blackburn asked Kathleen Sebelius about this today at that hearing. Let's take a listen. Uh, before, during, and after the law was passed, the president kept saying, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. So is he keeping his promise? Yes, he is. Okay. What do you say to the 300,000 people in Florida you just mentioned or to the 28,000 in Tennessee that cannot get health insurance? Their plans are terminated. Is he keeping his promise to them? Well, first of all, um, Congresswoman, they can get health insurance. They must be offered new plans, uh, new options, either inside the marketplace or if they don't qualify for a uh, financial subsidy, they can shop in what or do out you of the say marketplace. To, they absolutely will have new coverage. What do you say to NBC News who says millions are going to lose their coverage? Well, in all deference to the press corps, um, many of whom are here today, um, I think that it's, it's important to be accurate about what is going on, and I would defer again to the uh, president of okay. the Blues Plan. Reclaiming People my will time. have ongoing coverage. They will be offered new plans. Madam Secretary, let me tell you in the something. The market right now will we'll qualify. What do you say to system. Mark and Lucinda in my district who had a plan, they liked it, it was affordable, but it is being terminated, and now they do not have health insurance? Insurance companies cancel individual policies year in and year out. They are a one-year contract with individuals. Okay. They are not lifetime plans. Let they me, are not an employer plan. Your let me move, let me move on. It's what they wanted, and I will remind you. Some people like to drive a Ford, not a Ferrari, and some people like to drink out of a red Solo cup, not a crystal stem. You're taking away their choice. React. Okay. Well, frankly, in, in the light of day, they keep saying what is not true, and nobody except for Raymond Arroyo and a few other people hold them to account. Nobody holds them to account. Uh, even the NBC story that broke, right, uh, Lisa Meyer's piece what was this pulled week. off their website for a time. It was it was it was actually reduced to a single sentence, and not by her, by Lisa Myers. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is a a concerted effort by the mainstream media in the United States. Uh, to to patch up the lies, the deception, to put a gloss on this whole horrible, and it's, it's part of a pattern. We had it with Benghazi, with the IRS, with the NSA uh, spying that's going on. Mm. I mean, for the President of the United States to say he didn't know until the summer uh, that some of the heads of states around the world uh, were being uh, eavesdropped on uh, mm -hmm. by way of their cell phones and other means, uh, it's not doesn't pass the straight face test. It's uh, just not true. You referenced that Lisa Myers piece yes. at NBC. What it showed is uh, through sources in the White House and the administration that they knew up to they three knew. years before exactly. that 40 to 60 percent of all policyholders would be bounced off of their health care because there are these 10 minimum 
standards that are required for everyone's health care plan. Yeah. Now, I want you to do address this because, I mean, if I'm a single person, my, my producer, for instance, why should he have to have maternity care as part of his health care? Why should he have mental health treatment or pediatric dental care? These are requirements in all health care plans. Is it fair for the government to dictate this is the only, you must have this or you can't have that health care? No, I, I think it is, it is a, an intrusion into the marketplace the likes of which we've never seen, to tell people they have to buy a product. And remember, this is a product. Mm -hmm. uh, under pain of coercion, you will be penalized if you don't. And that's what the individual mandate is all about. They call it the individual mandate. It means you are coerced into buying health care, whether you want to or not. And a lot of young people don't want to. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the rubs of the whole thing is the CBO, Congressional Budget right. Office, they say that in 10 years from now, 2023, 31 million people still won't have health insurance. Uh, you know, so for all of this, this trauma that they're imposing upon Americans across the board, uh, especially the age categories, right. I mean, if I were a young people, person uh, in my 20s, I would be outraged no. as to how the president is going after the young people of America and saying, you buy this or else, and then jacking up the amount of money that they have to fork over, mm -hmm. you know, as they're just coming out of the blocks beginning their careers, coming out of college with, with college debt and all those issues, and now they're being told they have to buy this thing. Well, and, and it's an inferior product, and that's the other part. Well, and the census said, the last census tells us, only 14% of the population was uninsured. That's the other thing. Most people had health insurance. And one of the things that he's doing with this entire uh, misguided initiative, they're incentivizing the end of employer-based health care, mm -hmm. which has been a mainstay. It has mm -hmm. set us apart from other countries that it is part of your compensation package right. with your employer to get health care. And the better employers do try, and they try hard to mm -hmm. make a very good product available to their employees as part of what attracts sure. good talent, and that competition has led to better and better uh, insurance plans. Well, that's now going to go uh, the way of the Etzel. Uh, it's going to be gone. Uh, in a matter of time. But the president says, he said it today in Massachusetts, or yesterday in Massachusetts, it gives people freedom, it's portable, pre-existing conditions will not be a barrier to, sure. to health care plans. Well, What's wrong with Well, that? on all of those points, they're the easiest, they're the areas where we had total consensus. Portability, I've been, and I'm not the only one in Congress, that's mm -hmm. been pushing portability for years, buying across state lines so you can pull your resources. Which you cannot uh, do under this plan. That's right. And, 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 and that's right, you got the exchanges. Right, you can't go to other states. You, you can go to a federal plan, but you can't go to that's other right. states. That's right. There is a multi-state plan, but again, mm -hmm. it, is, it is administered by uncle. Uh, and, 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 pre, and the idea of pre-existing, my wife and I, when we had our first child, mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, who's now 35, mm -hmm. uh, I went from one job to another, and we did lose our health care. We know what that's like. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to bear the burden of the entire birthing, uh, you know, in terms oh. of cost, and I was just... Out of know, pocket, yeah. Just out of pocket. So all of of us understand pre-existing health insurance and the importance of having that pre-existing conditions. I mean, particularly when there's cancer or something involved. Sure. There's a total consensus on Capitol Hill for that. So that's the the easy lift uh, that we we could have passed in a bipartisan way. And and there are pieces of legislation proffered by my side of the aisle, Republicans, yeah. that would yeah. do all of these things. Well, what about Mary Landrieu's bill? Uh, our senator from, from Louisiana, Mary Landrieu, Democrat, right, is saying, sure. why not give people, let's make good on the president's promise, if you have an insurance plan, you should be allowed to keep it, and it will be grandfathered in. Would you support a bill like that? Uh, of course I would. I mean, but, if the bill, uh, the plans are being canceled now. But, but so. again, the president has refused to negotiate on anything related to Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Mary Landrieu is running for re-election. This is nothing but a political gambit on her part. She needs to be held accountable, as well as anyone else who voted for Obamacare, for that critical vote that has put us and every American in this very, very terrible situation. I want to play a little exchange. This is from that hearing the other day, Kathleen Sebelius being, being addressed by Representative Rogers. And this was about the security of the website, the government health care website, which incidentally was down during the hearing. Yeah. Take a listen. Has each piece of that code that's been introduced in the system been security tested? That's my understanding, yes, sir. And the each testing... Pe each piece of that code has um, been tested. I, yes I or no? I should not... I don't know. Okay. Um, that's but problem. I can that's, tell you that security that's a much testing safer answer, trust is me. an ongoing 
operation that as code is loaded, you need to retest uh, over and over and over again. So whether it's pretested, I can't right. you. You need to you test the code. Have uh, any end-to-end -end security tests been conducted since healthcare.gov went live on October 1st, yes or no? My understanding is there is continuous testing as the um, uh, author uh, but, uh, temporary authority uh, uh, operates. Yes, no. yes or no? Has an end-to-end -end security test on healthcare.gov uh, went live? Yes or no? I will find out exactly what testing yeah. they're doing. I know they're doing simultaneous testing as new code is loaded. Uh -huh. What do, you, what do you make of well, this? Well, again, I think many Americans are already very suspect when they go online, mm -hmm. you know, ensuring that their credit cards, if they pay online, uh, are all protected. Oh. We now have people who will be handling the data. Uh, Verizon, who, running this federal hub. And, and who hub. are these people? We know that people that have been hired uh, in the National Security Agency, like Snowden, yeah. had access yeah. to incredible amounts of information that he now has dumped uh, yeah. and, and has yeah. revealed to the world. Well, what happens when there's something that, you know, we know that people do want to keep their health information private, especially if it's a sexually transmitted disease issue right. or perhaps they might have some emotional or psychological problems. They deserve to have privacy. It shouldn't be available to some bureaucrat who then can, you know, either mishandle it or leak it, but mostly more likely mishandle it, and it becomes more public knowledge. Speaking of NSA, we heard a report from Snowden that uh, the NSA has now tapped into Yahoo, Google, anyone who subscribes to those email services. Now all of their emails are attainable, and the NSA may indeed have them. We also had a report that they were spying on Pope Francis yeah. during the last conclave. Your reaction to this? Well, when is Congress going to check up on the NSA? Well, uh, we need to be doing very vigorous oversight, and thankfully, Jim Sensenbrenner has introduced legislation that would severely cut back on their ability to surveil Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe the surveillance of foreign dignitaries, yeah. including uh, Chancellor Merkel and, right. and so many other people. <laughs> Not the Pope. Uh, you know, in Brazil, in our, our good close friends in Mexico, the president of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we keep getting denials that they're doing it. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. and, and the president is trying to assert that he didn't know about it until uh, the summer. That doesn't pass the straight face test either because you know what does this man know he doesn't know about the IRS scandal doesn't know about all these bumps in the road and they're huge bumps they're mm -hmm. they're craters uh, with Obamacare particularly with the rollout mm -hmm. every time somebody in the administration will say oh the president didn't know the president didn't know yeah. that he's either very incompetent and does not have a curiosity to know what his own administration is doing uh, or they're just not telling the truth mm -hmm. and frankly to know that he said <clears throat> and everybody has seen it you can keep your health care if you want it. Well, that turned out not to be a big lie. And then you have the situation even with abortion. He went right to that chamber, the House chamber, and told a joint session of Congress that the principles of the Hyde Amendment, no public funding for abortion, right. uh, would be cherished and protected in Obamacare. That is absolutely untrue. We are now uh, on the verge, beginning January 1st, mm -hmm. of the biggest expansion of public funding for abortion in the history of the United States. Even members of Congress now will have public subsidies in terms of the money that will go mm -hmm. to our staff and ourselves that can buy plans that include abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, where did that come from? Bart Stupak was promised yeah. promised as a condition of his vote for Obamacare and the other pro-life Democrats that abortion was off the table. It's not only not off the table, it is an integral part uh, of the Obamacare plan in the rollout. And, and we're, again, who gets hurt? Unborn babies, their mothers. Uh, you know, if, the, if it's subsidized, it makes it, that, it facilitates abortion. Mm -hmm. And we know for, for a fact, when there's public funding for abortion, the number of abortions go up. Yeah. That's why the Hyde Amendment and my amendment and all the others have literally saved lives, because without subsidy, it's less likely that the abortion will be procured. It's part of the mix that leads to an abortion. Very quickly, you oversaw an important hearing this week. Uh, when you were last on the <clears throat> program, you talked about a Syrian war yeah. Cr criminal war tribunal that would bring these people to justice, the perpetrators in Syria, no matter which side they might be on. What is the status of that? What did this hearing achieve? Well, the, the hearing really was a 
a landmark hearing. We had former prosecutors, including David Crane from the mm -hmm. Sierra Leone War Crimes Tribunal, which was a was a very effective means of holding people, including Charles Taylor, yep. uh, who got 50 years and will be in prison for the rest of his life uh, for the horrible bloodshed he unleashed upon the Liberians, especially the Liberians. Uh, this would, uh, my proposal is to establish an ad hoc uh, tribunal. The International Criminal Court is up and running. It's been in effect for about a decade. It has had 18 indictments, one conviction. It doesn't work. And it's more likely to just pick out a couple of high-level people, maybe Assad, mm -hmm. uh, if it ever gets a referral from the UN. We need to go after people on both sides, including the al-Qaeda operatives mm -hmm. and others in the Syrians on the uh, rebel side and the Assad forces that are committing atrocities and put them behind bars for the rest of their lives. So this is a very serious uh, and, I think, a meaningful way of holding people to account, meting out justice, for the victims, giving them some semblance that, that if you commit these crimes, you're going to do time. Christians in Syria are saying they are being targeted. Without a doubt. Are they? Without a doubt. I held a hearing last June, and it's only gotten worse, especially from the rebel side, mm. Assad too, but especially the rebel side, where Christians are being targeted, and it's a genocide. The, the witnesses at my hearing were unanimous in their appraisal that the Christians aren't being caught in the middle it's not a matter of collateral damage. You know, no. they were in the wrong place at the mm -hmm. wrong time. Uh, they're being targeted precisely because they are Christians. Before we go, yes or no, should we be continuing aid to Egypt, as the administration is asking? This is a coup, and by American law, you're not supposed to give aid to any country that has come to power via a military coup. I believe we need to be pressing for an end to the Muslim Brotherhood's political... I mean, Morsi did some very terrible things. Mm -hmm. uh, I just raised the Coptic Christians issue yep. again this week at a hearing. I've had three hearings. I'm going to do another one on December 10th, and we're going to have a Coptic Christian bishop as our lead witness uh, to speak to the terrible mistreatment uh, that these... Under, under the Morsi regime. Uh, under the Morsi regime. Uh, we're trying to reach out to this interim military government uh, to put a halt... And it has gotten better, but it's not good at all. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues that I've raised that the administration has failed miserably on, uh, and, and they've had the information and it's actionable, and that's all these Coptic Christian girls who are being abducted mm -hmm. and, and forced into Islamic marriages. Uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Uh, th that's, that's a form, a terrible form of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Congressman Thank Smith. You. Thanks for being here. When we return, on the 40th anniversary of their landmark film, The Exorcist, author and screenwriter William Blatty and director William Friedkin are here to tell us the real story behind the scariest film of all time. When the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. <laughs> What I think is best for your daughter. Six months under observation in the best hospital you can find. You show me Reagan's double. Same face, same voice, everything. And I'd know it wasn't Reagan. I'd know in my gut. I'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that! Welcome back to The World Over Live. When you ask people, as I did this week on Facebook, what's the scariest film you've ever seen, the most common answer is, of course, the Exorcist. This year marks the 40th anniversary of that landmark film to celebrate and share the secrets of this movie that has captivated generations. We're joined by the creative team that brought it into being. Academy Award-winning novelist and screenwriter of The Exorcist, 
William Peter Blatty is an old friend of the program. And joining us by phone is Academy Award-winning director of The French Connection and, of course, The Exorcist, William Friedkin. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure Happy being with you. Happy to be here Reynolds. and especially to be on with Billy. Now, oh, well, Billy, no, I now, love you. Now, the Reader's Digest, as you were telling me just a moment ago, mm -hmm. uh, Bill, uh, once again, when they asked what's the scariest film, The Exorcist was number one. Why does this film continue to fascinate all these years later, and why does it retain its power to frighten people so? Well, there are two reasons, of course. Uh, one, the first one uh, is going to sound like an advertisement for myself and for Billy Friedkin, but it's a wonderfully carpentered and told tale mm -hmm. filled with suspense. Uh, and the second is that it's not, well, there are three reasons. The second would be that when you see it in a theater, mm. it's, a, it's a communal, community experience that you want to share with that you've really never seen it until you see it in the theater. Mm -hmm. And the third, of course, is the purpose for which I wrote the novel in the first place, which was apostolic which is to reach souls by way of supporting their faith, by giving them evidence that, that God exists. And this is done by implication, actually. Right. 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 Billy may have a different is theory of it, like but mine is that you convince them that there really is something called demonic possession, and believe me, there is. And, well, the next question is, yeah, there are demons. Well, gee, why not angels? Wait a minute. That means death is not oblivion. Mm. There are spiritual, there are souls. I mean, we live forever, in effect. We're immortal. I think that's a part uh -huh. of it. Well, it's, it's just opinion. Yeah. I don't know. Mr. Friedkin, what's your take? Why are people still fascinated and so frightened by this? With all the technology, with all the, the special effects that are in films now, why does this one retain its power? Because it's really not about special effects. It's, mm. as Bill says, it was conceived as a kind of uh, apostolic uh, story. And... Um, Every time it comes out, there are new generations that are seeing it for the first time. I'm extremely proud of the film because uh, Bill asked me to direct it, not the studio. The studio mm. didn't want me to direct it, but Bill did, and he held out for me. And I don't know why. Perhaps he can explain it yeah, to that, you. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. You know, because you all, you had a first meeting, which you relate in your hilarious and very exciting <laughs> new memoir, The Friedkin Connection. Uh, in it, you tell the story of first meeting Bill in Blake Edwards' office yeah. and mm, putting yeah. in a not-too-kind review of his Peter Gunn script, as I remember. Yet, years later, you All right. asked Mr. Here Friedkin my to direct. Why? Of Rashomon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Billy is essentially correct. Uh, I had co-written a Peter Gunn feature film with Blake Edwards, who was the creator of the character. And uh, Billy was uh, to interview a potential director of the film, and it happened to be Billy Friedkin. I'd never heard of Billy Friedkin, but hmm. Billy objected to a sequence in the film, in the script, which was a dream sequence. Mm. And why? He said, well, it is not of the texture of the rest of the film. I had written that. Nobody, he didn't know that, but I had written it. But who jumped up to defend it? Blake Edwards, his potential employer, right? <laughs> he wouldn't back off. I said, oh, kid, you, you have as much chance of getting this gig as I have flying <laughs> over the studio <laughs> building here. And so it was. He didn't get the gig. But you see, on my first film, I remember the director. It was a comedy, Frank Tashlin, standing at my producer's desk. He wanted to make a phone call. He said, I'm doing this picture because I need a hit. And he held up my script. And this is a monster hit. Well, until he signed the contract, <laughs> and then he changed everything. <laughs> oh, I said, he's honest. He won't lie to me. 
-hmm. And secondly, he is an award-winning director of, also of documentaries. Mm -hmm. And with a story as wild as this, that's what I need. Someone who will shoot this with the eye of a documentary filmmaker to give it that overlay of this is complete reality. Mm -hmm. This is not a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And he did not disappoint me. Well, I, had I, to, go I ahead, directed Bill. the film as a believer. I believe in the details of the story. Hmm. Um, why? Do, I'm not a Catholic, yes. but, but this story is about the mystery of faith. And I certainly believe in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, we approached it as an apostolic story. Hmm. And everybody who sees it today, the new generations of people who weren't even born when it came out, let's say they don't believe anything they're atheists, whatever, they're still concerned about the idea of good and evil mm -hmm. and why bad things happen to good people. But Mr. Friedkin... The Exorcist, in a way, offers a solution to that or a concept mm -hmm. of why that is. You say in your memoir, though, this, uh, that the, the film changed your approach to belief and changed your beliefs. How did it? Well, it deepened it. I mean, I was never a doubter. What the hell do I know? I mean, the phrase that I operate under is Hamlet's advice to Horatio, which is there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Well, it's certainly the whole experience and Bill's own beliefs had a very great effect on me. He never pushed anything on me. But when I read the novel, and before I got into... Uh, layers of research that underpinned this great novel, um, I came away as, as a believer. I, I knew that mm. I, this was not going to be approached as a horror film, mm. and it is not. It's a film about the mystery of faith. Mm. You, you all never, uh, I just heard that from Mr. Friedkin, and you've told me that over the years. You don't regard this as a horror film, Bill Blatty. Oh, God, neither does Billy. No. Oh. No, no. I, when I was writing... Both understand no. that the story is very disturbing. Yeah, he knew it's... the story was disturbing. It was inspired by one of the three uh, cases that were... Um, uh, uh, in which the Catholic Church uh, found reason for an exorcism mm -hmm. in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. This was one of those cases, the one that inspired Bill. Mm. And so I had this underpinning of reality. Um, Bill wanted to write it, I know, as a, a nonfiction book, but he couldn't get the facts then. Yeah. So, so he wrote it as fiction, but it's inspired by an actual case which is mm -hmm. every bit as astounding mm -hmm. as the novel. Which you heard about in that class in 1949 at, at Georgetown, and then you kind of freelanced a bit around the edges. In, in, in the Friedkin connection, um, Bill Friedkin says, you based some of these characters on friends of yours. The actress was based on Shirley MacLaine. She, is, uh, she was the 100% model hmm. that I wanted for this. I wanted, some, I, I, I wanted a comedy film star, uh. a singer and dancer, the last person you would ever expect to have a possessed child mm. and the last person to actually think she has a possessed child and a non-believer and a non-believer and you know Shirley and I were great friends and she was I wrote her I remember knocking on her door dead drunk with a copy <laughs> of the manuscript of the novel in my hand she came to the door Bill Shirley Harry this <laughs> Gonna make you a star. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you you based Burke Dennings the. Oh, De you're right. Uh, Billy is right. I based the character of Burke Dennings, the British director who gets killed in the film, on J. Lee Thompson, whom I also knew, who directed John Goldfarb. Mm -hmm. And I think, Bill, that you um, sort of drew on your own experiences in writing Father Karras. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your own belief yes. system and a time in yes. your life when you questioned your own beliefs. Absolutely, and a great deal of guilt uh, concerning my mother you know, mm. and, and 
the fact that I was not with her at the end. And, and the other focus that the new, and we should say, there is a new DVD release of this film, and it is an outstanding Blu-ray edition. This is the first time I have dared to watch this film in its totality. And I watched both the theatrical and the director's cut. And I want to talk about both of those, because watching both of these versions, I was struck that this movie is really not so much about Regan, the, the young, possessed girl, as it is about Father Karras. Absolutely. He's the real focus of the... He's where the battle is taking place. When I was writing the novel, I had a, a little young, youngish, middle-aged uh, uh, typist uh, named Beverly Gray in the valley. And she knew I worked all night long, you know, until morning. And one night she called me. She was my type. She called me and said, Mr. Blatty, what? I think they're after him. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Who's him? Karis. They're after him. Who? The demons. They want him. And he, of course, always in my mind, and which Merrin knew, was the target in this mm. case of possession. The other thing, yeah. I think, that has kept the film before the public, the film, mm -hmm. the, the book has always uh, been before the public, right. but I think what's kept the film alive and still playing in theaters and in people's homes is this fantastic cast that we were blessed with uh -huh. who embodied their characters. They are inseparable from their characters. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I believe that the cast was a gift of God uh -huh. because with only two exceptions, <laughs> we didn't set out to get any of those people Linda Blair was handed to me on my doorstep, basically. Her mother brought her in without an appointment oh after we God. thought we couldn't cast this role at all. <laughs> I want to talk about this director's cut because I know there was some controversy, which far be it from a journalist to stoke more controversy, <laughs> but between the two Bills here, Bill Blatty and, and Bill Friedkin, uh, there were a few key scenes that, Mr. Blatty wanted in the final cut. You, Mr. Friedkin, decided to take them out. First Bill. Well, it's been cut that first I Bill Blatty. Bill. Let, let me go to Bill Blatty first, and then I want to <laughs> get because uh, there, there, there's particularly that scene between Karis and Father Marin when they come out of the exorcism and they're That's sitting what? on the steps. Why this girl doesn't make sense. I think the point is to make us despair. To see ourselves as animal and ugly. To reject the possibility that God could love us. Will you excuse me, Damien? Why did you want that scene in there? Well, it laid out the entire, my opinion, mm -hmm. core of the film. And there was also a practical reason for it, which was, if you understand what this case of possession is all about, then you in the audience have a reason to not hate yourself for enjoying some of the most, you know, lurid and, and shocking content that is necessary mm -hmm. in the film. But there, there was, there's beyond that. I want to tell you, the first time I saw the film was in a, standing up in a moviola mm. provided by Billy, and an editor's assistant would keep bringing in new reels for me. And I sprinkled holy water on that. By the way, this was at an office building, the address of which was 666 Fifth Avenue. Oh, my not, God. I am not making that up. Uh, I loved it. it was, I thought it was Then why did you sprinkle masterful. holy water? I, no, that's, you know, my, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the kind you sprinkle at a wedding or a baptism. Mm -hmm. The version that has the added 12 minutes in it, right. It's not really added. It's the restoration of the cut 
that Billy first showed me. It was his cut, ah. and I loved it. Well, Bill is correct. Uh, the film is, is what's called the director's cut is, is misnomer. <laughs> it's not a director's cut. It was the original cut I showed Mr. Blatty, as he told mm. you. Mm -hmm. um, I then went back and I rethought <laughs> my cut. And after Bill had approved it, and I thought it was too long for one thing, so I took out 12 minutes. <laughs> one of the scenes I took out was the scene between Monty's Father Karras and Father Marin on the stairs. <laughs> I actually felt, after seeing the picture again with a few uh, days in between, when I looked at it again, it occurred to me that that scene, as beautiful as it is, was only um, w was overstatement. I felt that the message conveyed in that scene, that what, when, when Father Karras asked Father Marin, why, why did this happen? Why this girl? And Marin tells him he thinks it's the demon trying to make us all look animal and ugly, like, mm -hmm. like we're not worthy of God's love. I thought that the entire film was saying that. And I felt that mm -hmm. this was just overstatement. Hmm. Now, 27 years went by, <laughs> and year 2000 came around, and Bill would call me regularly and say, Billy, would you consider putting this stuff <laughs> back in? And I always resisted. And I used to call Bill a sore winner. <laughs> I said, Bill, you, you have, the film has done so well. It is so respected and loved and it's been so influential, hmm. and you've made so much money on it, <laughs> and it, it's out there, let it alone. And then finally he called me, and there was just something in his voice, because I had come to love Bill Blatty very much. Hmm. And there was a time that came around when I heard in his voice a kind of a plaintive note, and I thought, I'm going to go look at this footage with him and, hmm. and see if I still don't believe it's necessary. We went into a little editing room at Warner Brothers. I looked at it and I thought, listen, if this is what he wants, why not? He mm. deserves to see the film as he believed in it. Mm. Even though the, the 12 minutes I cut seemed to work miraculously well with an audience. Mm -hmm. But I must say that this new version, which they call the director's cut, mm -hmm. which it isn't, um, I believe it's more powerful, yeah, and no, I believe it's, it's better. I think Blatty was right. When we left the editing room, I said to him, you know, Bill, I finally figured out what you were getting at. Mm. And this was 27 years later when we issued that particular cut yeah. in 2000. Yeah, well, I have to say, I mean, it is the highest grossing film, one of the highest grossing films of all time, uh, Academy Award winning it really didn't need much doctoring, Bill Blatty. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to I end with this. Um, you two recently returned to what used to be known as the Hitchcock Stairs right there in Georgetown. Now, everybody in my generation calls it the Exorcist Stairs because it is so iconic. What was it like being back there for both of you, Bill Blatty? Well, you know, together. I, I, oh, together. Well, I mean, it was... Very nostalgic, I must tell you the truth. Quite a lot of memories came to mind. Very, very, very good ones. Love to do it all over again. Hmm. Phil Friedkin? Well, <laughs> those steps have never left my consciousness. Hmm. Nor has Bill Blatty. You know, we, we, are, we are like brothers. Hmm. We don't see each other that... I think we call ourselves brothers in Christ. Hmm. Correct. Mm. And, and I believe that's what we are. So uh, it was interesting being on the steps. I mean, the house has been changed. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a big black fence around it. I'm, I, I'm not sure who lives there now, but... Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm I want to know. I'm not going to knock on the door and ask, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yes, it was always, it's always great to see Bill anywhere. And uh, the <laughs> nice, opportunity really. that that uh, U.S news or whatever, USA, USA Today, Today. Uh, yeah. gave us to do that segment for their paper and their website, it, it was a real pleasure to, mm -hmm. I sort of interviewed Bill on those steps and asked him, 
um, how it came about that he set that those scenes on those mm. steps. Ray, there is something I, I want you to get from Billy be, before mm -hmm. we leave the program. And uh, as you may know, the Georgetown uh, AMC Theater is running The Exorcist starting Halloween night. Right, for, for a, a week. week. Now, this is the director's cut, you know, mm. the expanded version. Uh, however, I would like Billy to discuss... I saw two reels of it in the AMC when Billy was in town. We were checking the print, wow. and I have never seen it with that. Uh, Billy told me, well, he, he can repeat it, that the print looked the way the scenes looked when he was looking through the lens of the camera filming them, wow. and this is a new experience. Billy, if you would like to add something to that. Well, we... What the audience is going to see, and by the way, Bill, I understand you're going to be in attendance on going tonight, to, on Halloween night. Yeah, going to introduce the film and uh, take, take questions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Wish this, you were this here. is the very best copy that's ever been made of this film. And that is because there's no dirt, there's no scratches, the mm. colors are true, the sound is as good as it's ever, it's better than it's ever been, and it's a new experience. Yeah, it is. Because we, this is a digital copy, and in the digital world, everything is as true um, as it could be to the original intent. The 35 millimeter print is, you know, no longer really being made. Mm. Um, but but the, I don't miss it. This digital copy, Bill, you mentioned it when we looked at it, you said this looks like three dimensions. It, to me, I had the impression that, you know, it was like two or three baby steps away from being 3D without the, the glasses. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's an honor. I've no, it's a never pure seen print. It. And you see oh, it on, I on the I could see Blu -ray every well. little blemish and wrinkle and crease on uh, Max's face. I, it, it was. It was it took my breath it's away. It's extraordinary. It's a, the terrifying new Blu-ray and DVD release, and it is pristine, the, of The Exorcist, is available in stores everywhere and online, as is the fascinating memoir by William Friedkin, The Friedkin Connection. Be sure to check both of them out. And, of course, the 40th anniversary of The Exorcist, the, the re-release with new scenes mm. that Bill Blatty added is also available at bookstores everywhere. They are well worth your time. And if you're in, Wa in the Washington, D.C. area, as you heard earlier, AMC is airing this new director's cut, and to see it in the theater in a screening is extraordinary, and they're airing it for a full week. They're showing it, and Bill Blatty is going to be at that kickoff the event AMC on Halloween. Georgetown. It is the yeah. AMC Georgetown on K Street. So we thank you both for being with us. Bill thank Blatty, you, Great Bill pleasure. Friedkin, I hope to reunite everybody in person next time. Good Happy to Halloween, again, Billy. Bill. God, God bless. bless. Okay. But before we go, Bill, uh, <clears throat> you had a complaint recently against Georgetown, a canonical complaint which you filed with the Archdiocese. It has since gone to the Vatican. We learned this week that there's a new course at Georgetown, right. which will teach girls how to advocate on behalf of the health care plan yes, exactly. and the abortion coverage within it. Yes, to make sure that you, uh, the abortion coverage is protected. This is a course at Georgetown Law, mm. teaching them how. I, listen, I, it is, I thought uh, that inviting Kathleen Sebelius to be a commencement speaker this woman who doesn't just support her, but I think she loves abortion. She was the bosom buddy of uh, Tiller. Mm. Uh, that's it. And we put together this petition, which the Cardinals now sent to Rome. But this is beyond the beyond. I am getting calls from so many mm. people who just cannot believe it. Mm. A long time ago, well, Seven, eight years ago, uh, a retired psychiatrist who used to be on the staff, I think, of Georgetown Hospital, we were talking about Georgetown. He said, you know, Bill, this was with the demons are running rampant on the campus. And I said, well, it's a bit of hyperbole. Okay. He was right. Hmm. He was right. Call so, Father Marin. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Bill. My Biden. pleasure, Raymond. Thank you, and happy Halloween. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. By the way, you can sign up for my free e-blast, I'll send you exclusive content each week. That's at the center of the page at RaymondArroyo.com. And be sure to tune into the program next week for my exclusive interview with the most watched man in cable news and mega best-selling author, Bill O'Reilly. He'll enter my no-spin zone. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.